When I crossed the Arizona-New Mexico state line, uh, in those days, this was Highway 66, it was two lanes, I crossed the line and almost literally as I crossed the line, I felt a kind of liberation in myself, a kind of coming home and a kind of being free that I had never known before. And it was exhilarating and it has really never left me. When I drove through Central Avenue, it was, it was really like, probably like the town was in 1945. It uh, was very busy, everybody was wearing hats, there were lots of cowboys, lots of Indians, and lots of Army and Navy people all around. I don't know why there were Navy people, but there were. Uh, it was a very active, lively hub of, of this whole region. Uh, compared to Los Angeles, Downtown Albuquerque was a real place as opposed to a stage set. Uh, even, even in the realest of real places in Los Angeles, it always sort of feels that if you go through a door, you'll come out the other side and there'll be nothing there. Here in downtown Albuquerque, you had the feeling that real lives were being lived in real buildings, that real languages were being spoken that real cultures were being intermingled. It was a very cosmopolitan place. And I like that immensely. Driving up to the university, you can imagine an 18-year-old who had just uh, crossed, crossed the desert for the first time. And everywhere I looked were these mountains and the sky and these views, you know. And so when I finally turned on to the New Mexico campus, I, I also saw this, this, uh, this wonderful welcoming and nurturing architecture. I suppose even, even I could tell that these structures were pulled up out of the land. They didn't look like they'd been sort of plopped on the place. They looked like they had risen out of the place. And so if you happen to be as, as, as transported as I was by the environment, by the landscape, and to suddenly see that same sort of sensation of, of coming home in buildings. It was a transforming event. And all the things that I really didn't like about uh, Los Angeles and about certain kinds of crowded, hectic, metallic, modern American places the University of New Mexico did not have. Uh, it looked like it had a past. It looked like it had some tradition. It looked like there was something worth trying to belong to. For me, Albuquerque really was literally a city at the end of the world. And that sense of being at the end of the world grew as I returned to Los Angeles time again. And individuals would ask me, you know, where, where are you now? I'd say, I'm out here in Albuquerque. And I'd say, where are you? you know? And so in my mind, I guess, this is a kind of a Timbuktu, a Marrakesh, a, where geographically and culturally so isolated that we're still a kind of a sanctuary and a lost place in a way. Uh, and I like that a lot. Urbanized world in which over half the population lives in cities. And a little town like Albuquerque is going to compete in the urban marketplace of the future. It must protect its greatest asset, which is its rarity, its individuality, its uniqueness. In the future, choice will be key. There'll be so many urban environments, there'll be so many human beings that the places that, that maintain their essential character and their respectful relationship to the land, I think will have a tremendous advantage over all of the other urban environments that don't. So I think that's our challenge in the next 20 years, is not to go for short-term, cheap-shot profits, 
but to maintain, to hang on to our essential character and beauty. Even with all that's happened to Albuquerque since the war, we are a beautiful place. We still have this landscape. We still have the river. We still have the volcanoes. We still have the mountains. We still have the bosky. We still have our people. We are a unique environment, and we are an endangered environment. Unique urban places are endangered places all over the world because of a, of a globalizing commercial culture which wants all of us to be the same kind of person. So it can sell things to us. Urban environments not only contain people and contain cultures, they shape them. So when you have a place as unique as ours with uh, different kinds of populations and different kinds of cultures intermingling, this is not a place that's easy to sell to. So what some people want to do to us is to sort of flatten us out, is to kind of make us like every place else, and that's why we're endangered. Culturally, uh, we are endangered because rapid growth is swamping us, uh, not necessarily with careless or uncaring human beings, but with just with huge numbers of people who know nothing about this town and who, more importantly, have been told nothing about it by our leadership. The collective myth of Albuquerque, which used to be so present in every place we went. When I came here in 1958, I met person after person after person who was proud to be a New Mexican, who was proud to be an Albuquerquean, who would tell you at the drop of a hat why they loved to live here, who understood all kinds of things about this place. Now you hardly meet anybody who knows anything about it at all. Now that's going to happen, obviously, if you have massive rapid growth like we have. But there's only one way to counteract that, and that is to have large-scale, persistent educational efforts on the part of all the schools and all of our elected leadership. And not just the kind of sloganeering that you know that goes into skiing and uh, the balloon fiesta. You've got to talk about real things, real human beings, real neighborhoods. Uh, we are and have always been a frontier contact zone, right from the start, right from the 12th century, when the great diaspora out of Chaco Canyon arrived. And then the Spanish came, and then the railroad came, and after the railroad, then the Cold War came. And so really, everything that's been happening in the West has been happening in Albuquerque in one way or another. We've always been a place that's had wave upon wave upon wave of, of uh, new immigrants. The scary thing that's that's happening now is that this wave upon wave is happening so fast that the collective consciousness of the pool of residents is kind of diluting when it comes to knowledge and love of New Mexico is concerned. And so whereas in the 17th century, um, everything came here very slowly, very, very slowly indeed, by wagon train and other things, in the 1990s, people come here and leave here in a matter of years. Uh, so although we have indeed become a kind of, uh, a kind of modern midden filled with the corpses of national fads and urban solutions, this midden is growing faster and faster and faster and faster and it's sort of covering up or threatening to cover up uh, that very integrity that we so badly need to preserve. In the long run, I guess it's the absence of love as much as, as rapid growth that causes eccentric towns like Albuquerque to become endangered places. People in a town like ours have to pay attention. And if you're going to love some place or someone, you must pay attention to it, to the connections between the present in the past. They've got to preserve those connections. And if they can, they have to slow down the rate of growth. These connections are, are largely symbolic connections that help us 
accumulate a kind of shared history, a kind of shared mythology about the place in which we live. If we destroy everything that was in order to add simply new things, we no longer have a, a place that has a history. And like human beings, people who don't have a history have amnesia. And if they have amnesia, uh, they have uh, no sense of who they are. And if they have no sense of who they are, they obviously have no identity. And if they have no identity, uh, they're lost in the world. Uh, so in a town like ours, which is growing leaps and bounds every day, every, almost every minute, uh, how, how carefully and respectfully we try to keep the connections with the past alive uh, is the degree to which uh, we flourish, I think, as a town that knows itself. So in a lot of ways, Albuquerque in the last 25 years has undergone such incredible growth and uh, in, in a lot of ways, I think, terribly disrespectful growth. And so it's, it's originality, it's individuality, it's personality as a distinctive eccentric town in the Southwest uh, is very close to being lost. And once you lose it, you never get it back. Endangered cities that have worked to preserve their connectedness with the past have realized that their towns have grown uh, geographically and that the farther from the center that their towns have grown, uh, the farther from the past they've also grown. So towns that have maintained their identities have struggled to keep the historical connection with the past in their downtowns. Now, we've struggled to do that, too. We've done a fairly good job of it. We have do not done a very good job here at Albuquerque High School. That's one way uh, to maintain connection. The other way to maintain connection is seen very graphically, I think, in Pueblo life, uh, is to have a respectful attitude t toward the land. And what that means in a fast-growing town, it means emphasizing infill development, development within the already developed core of the town, as opposed to sprawl development out into the wilderness. If one of Albuquerque's great assets is the natural wilderness around it, uh, then the more we grow into it and despoil it, uh, the more we've compromised that asset. Urban history is a complicated thing, but you can see it in, in how a town is growing. You can see it in the development pattern. You can see it in the architecture. It's all there. Um, if you went to Memphis without Beale Street, what would you have? If you come to Albuquerque without downtown, what do you have? You, you have a town that might as well be any place. And I think that's the key to everything. Uh, if you're endangered, you are endangered of becoming any place. You are endangered of losing your collective memory. You are endangered of becoming someone with amnesia. You can't remember where they are or what they are. Urban shock is what happens to a small place when it suddenly becomes a big place. When its older residents can drive around in town and not know where they are, where its teachers and its local historians no longer can get their message across to the vast majority of people. Urban shock is indeed what happens when a, a small town gets flooded with new people and when it's not prepared to deal with it. And I just don't mean in terms of roads and water and lights and that kind of stuff and cops. I mean also in terms of history, in terms of mythology, in terms of an understanding of the identity of the place in which they inhabit. If they don't understand that, uh, then they will do anything to it. They'll treat it as if it was any other place because it doesn't have any 
special meaning. They don't love the place. They don't understand it. They don't know it. If you have a place like we do, uh, whose whole future depends on maintaining a sense of place, whose whole economic, not to mention spiritual, future depends on having and maintaining an identity and a connection with the past. And if you have elected leaders who don't understand that, who are willing to squander the precious treasure that we have, uh, then, you have then you have no hope at all. So what we have to do uh, over the next 25 years or so is constantly try to elect leaders who know about this town, who love this town, The ruins at Koala are, in their own way, every bit as exciting as Chaco Canyon, not as, as ruins, per se. Uh, what they really show you, I think, is, is the ancient relationship between Anasazi and Pueblos and the land. When you go to Koala and you look at those mountains, you know that those mountains are a sacred thing. That view is like, is like walking into a church. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing. It's like, it is an icon. It is an icon of presence, of location, of time, of direction. And in a certain sense, that, that sense of holiness uh, that the Pueblos have about, about our landscape uh, is, is the key idea, I think. This whole geography is a sacred landscape to them. One of the really intangible qualities, if you live here long enough to fall in love with this place, one of the things that you're falling in love with is a kind of unconscious recognition that there are maybe thousands of human beings who live around you who do believe that the land is a holy place, that the landscape and that the geography is sacred. And I think in a lot of ways that, that uh, although it's completely intangible and impossible to document, I think that kind of halo of belief and reverence that circles this town, uh, gets to you after a while. It's a fascinating thing to think about, is that running right through the middle of a major American city is a, what amounts to really a wild river. And that's, the, and that's the Rio Grande with all of its animals, all of its turtles and its muskrats and its coyotes and its hawks and its ravens. And it goes right from the edge of town right to the other end of town. And, and of course, that, that string of water connects us with all the rest of New Mexico. The wild land of the Rio Grande is not a commercial river like the Mississippi or, or the Missouri. It is a natural preserve. Now what that does is, is that it connects visibly, materially, palpably, connects Albuquerque to its land. And that is Albuquerque's greatest asset. If you have a particular talent, or if you have a particular beauty, you want to emphasize that talent or that beauty. In our town, we have this river, this unique river, this wilderness river, this wild place that refreshes us and revives us, that makes the rest of the town really bearable. I like the fact that the river, that a wild river is running right through the middle of Albuquerque because it shows our extraordinary eccentricity. No other city in America has that. I believe that what you need is catalytic leadership. You need leadership from all levels of the town to come and say, one, this is a beautiful place. Two, we respect this place, we respect ourselves. Three, we want new business, but we want them to come here on our terms and do what we want them to do for us. 
we're in a wonderful place anyway. Why do we have to give away the store? We need leaders who can help us re-educate ourselves. We need them in business. We need them at schools. We need them at city hall. We need them in the county. We need them all over. We need people to finally, and I do believe this passionately, to finally stand up and say, we love this place. This is a wonderful place to be. This isn't some junk town. You can do anything in the world you want to do. This is Albuquerque. This is a beautiful place. This is a rare place. This is a place to love and to cherish and to nurture, not to wash over and blade over and build over and write over, uh, but a place to really love and take care of. That's what we need. In the 17th century, when the Spanish conquistadors arrived here, they called this place a miserable kingdom, uh, backward and remote beyond compare. What kind of happened to New Mexico in their eyes is what always happens to faraway places. Uh, there's a kind of a universal association between distance and deprivation. But you know, at the turn of the 21st century, when the rest of the world is poisoned by toxic waste and tormented by overpopulation, being remote beyond compare might well be a, a blessing beyond compare. Uh, you remember the, uh, the kids in school uh, who, who really looked like they had incredible potential to become something really good, you know? And, and 20 years later, you realize that, my God, they didn't realize that potential at all. Something happened to them. Probably what happened to them is they got caught in, in a false image of who they were. They were told that they couldn't do what they wanted to do. Uh, in a certain sense, we have been told that by the rest of the world and by our leaders. To believe the negative image of yourself that others project upon you is a disaster. And because Albuquerque is at the end of the world indeed, and because it's a little town with a funny name, uh, we have a terrible, bad reputation around the country as a kind of a jerkwater place. And we tend to believe that. Even with the evidence right before our eyes, even with the most extraordinary beauty right before our eyes, we tend to believe what New Yorkers say about us. We tend to believe what Angelinos say about us. That has got to stop. If we don't stop that, we will always be adolescents. We will always be trying to please our supposed betters. I can't truly believe that living in Los Angeles or living in New York uh, is better than living in Albuquerque. Not these days. We need to really do one fundamental thing. I think. We need to talk amongst ourselves actively, vigorously, for as long as it takes, come up with some mutually agreed upon image of who we are. As they say, a shared vision of who we are. And then meticulously and carefully and maturely work to bring that vision about. If that vision is connected to our history and connected to our landscape and connected to the desires and the values of existing residents, then we have the kind of respectful continuity, the kind of respectful growth that will cause us to flourish in the future. If it is disconnected from our, our history and our landscape, then we become the victims of disrespectful growth. We become dissed in the real sense of the word, and we have no recourse. We fail. We lose our individuality. We lose our hopes for any kind of real quality of life. Uh, when, you, when you jeopardize and sacrifice sense of place for quick bucks, when you let exploiters exploit you, when you roll over and play dead, you have to expect to be very unhappy <laughs> and very dissatisfied with your life. If you have some idea of who you are and what you want to be, and you can plan, and you can work, and you can act. Uh, until we do that, until we have a town that's talking to itself, 
and it's really concerned with crafting its own future. We're going to be vulnerable to every robber, every exploiter, every developer who can't do anything else, any place else, but here. Cities at the end of the world are one of a kind places. Like all oddities, uh, they are vulnerable to misunderstanding and disregard. If no one else cares much about them, um, at least their own people must. And if their own people don't, um, then they risk the continual vanishing of the very reasons of why they call such places home. Surely a place that's, that's so, that is loved by so many people, surely such a place will not end up betraying its individuality. Our struggle really is to learn to love ourselves for what we are and to become the full, rich, beautiful place that we've always known in our hearts we really are. This Colores program is available on home video cassette for $19.95, plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-328-5663.